This is the tenth in a series of 80 Old Testament lectures. And actually, this is more of a review than it is a lecture that will give new information. We find that it is extremely important here at the Thomas Road Bible Institute, the regular permanent two-year program here at the church, to spend time in review. And so we hope that you won't, as a student, bypass this tape and go on to the next, because even though we'll be going over some very familiar ground, we'll probably add a few new facts, but basically this will be a time of reviewing what we've already learned. Someone has once said, it is not difficult to learn a subject without reviewing it. It is impossible. And we believe that that is a very true statement. The creation stage, of course, consists of 11 chapters, Genesis 1 through 11. And there are 22 important names that we spoke of in this chapter, are these chapters. And let's go back by way of review and simply discuss the characters that appear during these chapters. And some we've already seen are real characters. The first course mentioned is Adam, Earth's first human, made from the dust of the ground, created in the image of God, and appointed as head of all earthly creation. This was Adam, and he was to subdue the earth. And of course, later on, he lost that because, as someone said, he got in a crooked poker game with the devil, as it were, and the devil cheated him out of it. But he was originally given to be the head over all earthly creation. And then Eve, the wife of Adam, taken from his own side. Interesting things about Eve. In the Bible, or in the human account of human history, God has used, selected four methods of bringing little ones into this world, or bringing human beings into this world. The first, he brought a human being into this world without the aid of mother or father, and that, of course, was Adam. Then, on one occasion, he brought a human being into the world without the aid of a mother, and this was Eve. And then, years later, he would bring a little one into the world without the aid of a father, and that was the Lord Jesus Christ. But all other human beings among the 40 to 50 billion people that scientists estimate have lived or are living upon this earth, uh, God brings them into the world through mothers and fathers. But God can do anything that he wants. And so here we have uh, the one individual case of a human being coming into the world without the aid of a father. And her name was Eve. And then we have the third character mentioned, the serpent. Creation's most beautiful and intelligent creature who tragically gave its body over to Satan. And the fourth mentioned is a man named Cain, Earth's first baby born to Adam and Eve, and he later became the first modernist and the first murderer. And then the fifth, Abel, his brother, Earth's second baby, who offered the right sacrifice to God and was murdered by his brother Cain. And the sixth individual mentioned, Enoch, the son of Cain, after which he called Earth's first city. Remember we said there were two Enoch's mentioned in the book of Genesis, the first few chapters. And one was the son of Cain, and the other, of course, was from the godly line of Seth. But the sixth character is Enoch, the son of Cain. And then seven, Lamech, Enoch's great-great-grandson. And we didn't discuss, discuss this in the original study during the second and third lecture, but he was Earth's first polygamist, and he was the second recorded murderer. You can read that account yourself. We could not cover every verse in the Bible, of course. In Genesis chapter 4, verses 18, 19, and 23. And then the eighth character was a woman whose name was Ada, and this was one of Lamech's wives. Remember, we said he was the first polygamist, and she gave birth to Jabel and Jubal. And uh, here we find this in Genesis 4, verses 19 to 21. And then Jubal, 
and Jabel are mentioned as 9 and 10, characters number 9 and character number 10. Jabel was the world's first cattleman, Genesis 4, verse 20. Jubal was the world's first musician and the inventor of the harp and the flute, Genesis 4, verse 21. And then character number 11, out of 22 characters mentioned here, Zilla, Z-I-L-L-A-H. This is Lamech's second wife who gave birth to Tubal-Cain, Genesis 4, verse 22. And then number 12, Tubal-Cain, the world's first metal worker, specializing in bronze and iron. Character number 13, Seth, Adam's third recorded son, from whom the spiritual seed would continue, which would lead to Christ. And then the 14th, the second Enoch, who was the first man to escape death, the first recorded preacher, and the father of Methuselah. And then Methuselah himself is character number 15, who was the son of Enoch, and the oldest man who ever lived, dying at the age of 969 years. Then number 16, Noah, the mighty ark builder, who would master the judgment waters, but not the vineyard wine. And then number 17, Shem, Noah's oldest son, and the founder of the Semitic people. And character number 18, Ham, who was Noah's middle son, and the founder of the Babylonians, the Egyptians, the Canaanites, and the African peoples. Then the 19th character, Japheth, Noah's youngest son, and the founder of Gentile people in general. And then number 20, Canaan, who was the son of Ham, upon whom Noah pronounced judgment for his sin against Noah in Genesis chapter 9, verse 25. The 21st character was Nimrod, from the line of Ham, a mighty hunter, perhaps of men, and the probable uh, instigator and organizer of the Tower of Babel project. And then number 22, Terah, who was the father of Abram, Genesis 11, verse 26. But here are some important names in the creation stage. And then by way of review now, the important action in the creation stage the first seven days, what God did on the first day, he creates light. And then the second day, he created the atmosphere. And then on the third day, he gathered the oceans and created seed-bearing plants. On the fourth day, he created the sun and the moon and the stars. And the fifth day, he creates fish and birds. On the sixth day, he creates animal, wildlife, reptiles, and man himself. And then on the seventh day, God rested. And then we studied concerning the first man. We said that Adam is created from the dust and made in God's image. He's given a wife, made from his own rib, his own side, and commanded to multiply and master the earth. And then he is warned to avoid the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then we saw the first human sin and sentence. Adam and Eve are influenced by Satan to disobey God. And Adam and Eve attempt unsuccessfully to hide from God. And then God pronounces a threefold sentence. Upon the serpent, that it would henceforth crawl upon its belly. Upon the woman, that pain would accompany her childbearing. And upon the man, that he would be forced to struggle in wrestling out a living from the soil. And that he would someday die himself. And then we saw that Adam and Eve are clothed by God and expelled from Eden. So we saw the first seven days, the first man, the first human sin and sentence, and then the first altar in Genesis 4. Eve gives birth to Cain and then to Abel, and Abel presents a lamb on the altar which God accepts, and Cain presents a crop offering which God rejects, and Cain murders Abel, and he flees to the land of Nod, which is the land of wandering. And then Eve gives birth to Seth, who follows in the way of Abel. And we saw the first obituary column in chapter 5, and we looked at several interesting facts. For example, Adam is 130 when Seth is born, and Adam died at the age of 930. Seth dies at the age of 912. And Enoch, we saw, was 65 when Methuselah was born, 
and he is translated to glory without dying at the age of 365. We saw that Methuselah dies at the age of 969, becomes the oldest person ever to live, and that Noah, at the age of 500, had fathered three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And then we see the first worldwide judgment in chapter 6 through 9. God determines to destroy mankind because of their horrible corruption. Noah and his family alone were to be spared. Noah is ordered to build a three-deck boat, 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. And then he was to gather into the boat the male and female species of every regular animal, and seven each of certain others which God had chosen for human consumption and for sacrificial purposes. And we saw the flood itself, the rains and floods began to con and continued for 40 days, and the earth is covered with water for 150 days. And the total time from that moment that um, Noah got on board the ark till he stepped off of it was exactly 371 days. And we see the floods recede, and God seals his promise with a rainbow that he will never drown humanity again. And then we see that Noah plants a vineyard and sins by becoming drunk. And the first family tree in Genesis chapter 10, we really didn't discuss that very much, but um, the descendants, and here it gives the descendants of uh, Japheth's sons. We have uh, four mentioned here. One is Gomer, and the other is Magog, the other is Tubal, and the fourth one is Meshach. And uh, all four of these will play an important part in the latter days just prior to the second coming of Christ. And you might like to compare these sons and the peoples that they founded with Ezekiel chapter 38. Because this actually this chapter tells us that in the latter days there will be a nation north of the land of Palestine and many lectures down the road when we come to the book of Ezekiel will discuss that. There seems to be linguistic and historical and, uh, hist and other kinds of proof that uh, this Gog and Magog, as mentioned here in Tubal and Meshach, uh, repeated again here in Ezekiel chapter 38, is a reference to Russia. And uh, Russia then invades Palestine, I believe, during the middle of the tribulation. But anyway, any rate, here we have the descendants of Japheth's sons. And then we see that the descendants of Ham, they built Nineveh, Babylon, Sodom, and Gomorrah. All of those cities, of course, were destroyed by God. Not because they were built by Ham, but because of the corruption that later developed in those cities. Uh, Nineveh was destroyed. Of course, it was spared for a long time. Uh, Jonah went and uh, preached repentance in the book of Jonah, and God spared the city of Nineveh, one of the cities that Ham built. And then about 150 years later, after Jonah had preached repentance, uh, Nineveh again got back into its terrible, corruptive ways. And this time God sent another prophet by the name of Nahum, and Nahum predicts the destruction of Nineveh. And the Babylonians did destroy Nineveh. And later on, then Babylon itself was destroyed uh, during the 6th century, in the 5th century actually, by Cyrus the Mede, and we read about this in Daniel chapter 5. And then uh, the descendants of Ham also built Sodom and Gomorrah, and uh, these two cities were destroyed during the days of uh, Lot, and Abraham in Genesis chapter 18, and we'll see that when we get to the life of Abraham. And then the ninth descendant from Shem was a man called Abraham, perhaps the one of the greatest, certainly one of the greatest of the three greatest men that we find in the pages of the Old Testament. The final thing we studied then was the first ecumenical council. This takes place in Genesis chapter 11. And here we saw that mankind attempts to unify itself apart from God through the building of a city and a tower. And God frustrates their effort by confusing their language and scattering them. Now, for the next 15 or 20 minutes, what we want to do 
is go through and pick out some spiritual significant lessons from these 11 chapters that I trust by this time that we've learned. Not everything that we've attempted to tell you is uh, of eternal importance, but these things that we'll bring out now, we certainly don't want you to forget. We want you to be able not only to pass the test, and we'll be covering these in the test later, but also to be able to teach them, and if you're a pastor listening, to be able to preach them, and at any rate, if you're a child of God, to be able to explain these to both saved and unsaved people alike. One of the things we discussed was the pre-creation activities of God, and we saw that God was very busy even before he created the world. He was having fellowship with his son, he was creating angels and stars, he was choosing the elect, and by the way, the Bible says that our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life before the foundation of the world, and I don't care what your name is, if you're a child of God, don't you ever complain and say, I wish I had a different name. I often said that uh, if someone had, uh, my folks had called me Carol, or uh, instead of Harold, if they'd uh, referred to me as a Doris or Mary Ann, I don't think I would have complained too much after I got saved, because if that's the name that God wrote down in the Lamb's Book of Life, uh, that's the name that will get me into heaven. And uh, But in the beginning, before God created the world itself, he was choosing the elect. And then we saw that he was planning for a church and that he was planning for a kingdom. And this refers to the millennial kingdom class in the New Testament. In Matthew chapter 6, the disciples asked Jesus to give them a model prayer, and he said he would. And uh, so he said, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And here he was referring to the millennial kingdom. That is to say, the time when, in the future, when the Lord Jesus himself would come to this earth and establish a 1,000-year reign of peace from the throne of David in the city of Jerusalem. But God was planning for this kingdom long before the world was created. And then, finally, he was planning for a Savior. We saw in 1 Peter 1, and also in Revelation 13, that Jesus Christ was slain in the mind of God before the foundation of the world. And do you know, uh, there are some that believe that when God put Adam in the garden, that uh, he put him there and uh, just assumed that he would obey and that he would partake of the tree of life and live forever in the state of holiness. And then Adam fooled God and... Uh, sinned, and then God was thrown into a panic, and God says, oh, what can we do now? And so there was a council in eternity, and a sudden conference meeting held, you see, and, and various plans were suggested, and finally the son says, well, I tell you what, why don't I go down and take upon myself the likeness of sinful flesh and be born of a virgin and die for the sins of the world, and we can redeem man. And then uh, God the Father breathed a sigh of relief and said, oh, that's that's great, that." That's sort of a stopgap plan. That's what we'll do. No, nothing could be further from the truth. Long before God created man, God had already planned for the incarnation and for the sinless life and for the death and the burial, the resurrection and the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this might bring us to an interesting point here now. Perhaps we should stop by way of review and add this little information. Why did God make man in the first place? We've already seen he did not make man because he was lonely. God had a son. God has a son. God always will have a son, a beloved son, a unique son, whose name is Jesus. But why did he make man? There are some that speculate that before the creation of man, God was having not only fellowship with his son, but God was having the opportunity to exercise his various attributes. For example, when he created the stars, he was having an opportunity to exercise his, his uh, omnipotence because of the mighty power it took to build the 
universe as we know it, with the stars and the various planets and galaxies. So by constructing the stars, God was having a chance to exercise the attribute of omnipotence. And then when he made the angels, and what a wise and what an intelligent being an angel must be, then God was having the opportunity to exercise his omniscience, his all-knowing attribute. And uh, other attributes were being exercised in the wisdom or in the councils of eternity. But some have speculated that there was one characteristic closest to the heart of God, perhaps, and yet he was not having the opportunity to exercise, and that was his grace. And so could it be, we do not know, but could it be that God determined this course of action I will create me a man in my own image. I'll put him in the Garden of Eden. I will not encourage him to sin, but I know that he will sin. And then in the fullness of time, I'll send my son, and my son will wrap himself in the likeness of that sinful flesh, yet without sin, and die upon the cross and redeem that fallen body of flesh and bone, and by doing all this, I will then have the opportunity to display my grace. And I believe, in part, this can give us an answer as to why God created man in the first place. He created him to display his grace. And I believe that we're told that in Ephesians 2, Paul says that in the ages to come, he, God, might display his, the exceeding richness of his grace, which he manifested in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I think this gives us a clue as to why God made man in the first place. And then remember we spent some time discussing the size of creation and oh, how mighty this universe is. There's a song, My Father is Omnipotent, and that I can't deny a God of might and miracle is written in the sky. It took a miracle to hang the worlds in space. It took a miracle to put the stars in place. But when he saved my soul, cleansed and made me whole, it took a miracle of love and grace. And by the way, while we're studying Concerning the creation account itself, creation in Genesis chapter 1 and Psalm chapter 8 ought to be compared with redemption in Isaiah chapter 53. You see, there are two great words in the Old Testament concerning the works of God. The first work was that of creation, and the second work, of course, is that of redemption. And it is far, was far more costly to God concerning matters of redemption than it was creation. And the reason that I said you need to think in terms of Psalm 8 and then uh, compare this with Isaiah chapter 53, because in Psalm 8, on one occasion, David was uh, commenting on the uh, mighty, magnificent act of creation. And David says, When I behold the sun and moon and stars, the work of thy fingers, David said, it just, it just takes my breath away. So here in symbolic language, God allows David to say that it took God's fingers to create the universe. But in Isaiah chapter 53, when Isaiah speaks about the suffering Savior, Isaiah says, Who hath believed our report and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Now, in the Old Testament, when we want to do something today, we roll up our sleeves and get to work. We bear our arms, as it were. In the Old Testament, they did that too, but they didn't roll up their sleeves. They sort of held up their hands, uh, their arms, as men, and they wore robes, and the robe would sort of fall back upon the elbow. They would bear their arms. And Isaiah is saying here, I've got a, a report that nobody's going to believe. It's so fantastic that the God of all creation is going to bear his arms. And here it speaks, of course, of the sufferings and the crucifixion of Christ. 
And the point of the story is this, the historical account that really happened. It took God's fingers to create man. It took God's arms to redeem him. And redemption is a trillion times more uh, costly than creation. It costs God nothing to create the world. It cost him every drop in the veins of his son to redeem the world. But we spend some time on the size of creation and then how small it was as well as how large it was. And remember all those trillions and trillions of stars. You know, scientists tell us that there are as many stars in the heavens as there are grains of sand on all the seashores of the world. And yet God not only knows the number of the stars, but we saw in Psalm 147, he's actually called them all by name. What a magnificent God we have. And then we look somewhat at some of the mysterious objects in the universe. And you'll see in your notes various things that we did not even discuss. Uh, quasars, and supernovas, and neutron stars, and black holes. God created them all in Genesis 1.1. We spend some time discussing the date of creation and how scientists attempt to, what methods they use in attempting to determine the age of a rock. Uh, they use the uranium lead method, the potassium argon method, but we saw that some of these methods are not always reliable, and sometimes there can be a mistake, calculation of millions of years. And uh, then from there on, we brought up some indications that perhaps this world and this universe is a good deal less than 5 to 15 or 50 billion years old that the scientists would have us believe. Now, there are indications that the world, the creation itself, not only just man but all of creation, might be a good deal less than 50,000 or perhaps even 10 or 12,000 years old. And uh, you'll find many of these notes here that we did not have a chance to go into. But as a student, now I expect you as the professor to read these notes and be able to at least uh, be familiar with some of the material that we didn't cover. We talked about the method of creation. We said there are three suggested methods whereby all things came into existence. The first is the atheistic uh, materialistic method. And this says that uh, evolving mud in time past brought in everything. Of course, we wouldn't even didn't even take too much time to answer that because it's so ridiculous. Uh, atheist materialism, and then the second uh, method we discussed is theistic evolution. And although many Christians believe this, we did not feel that it was feasible, or either scientific or uh, scriptural, according to the Word of God. The third method, then, was that of special creation. And the Bible definitely seems to teach this because of the very language itself. Remember the word olam, O-L-A-M, means a long period of time. And the Hebrew word yom, Y-O-M, means a, normally means a 24-hour day. And in the first few chapters of Genesis, you do not read the word olam, but you do read often the word yom mentioned. So we take language as it should be taken, literally, in a normal historical context, the Bible teaches that God created the world and the universe in six literal 24-hour days. And then the proposed gap between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. And I hope that we have not uh, caused anybody to fall out over fellowship because many people, and as much as this is in the Schofield Bible, and they feel it's inspired. I believe the Schofield is one of the best study Bibles available, and I've worn out several, but friends, we do not, uh, we should not take Schofield's notes as absolutely being infallible. They're extremely helpful, but see, I Schofield was just a man as other men are, and he was not inspired. We attempted to list several reasons why we feel that there was no gap between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. And then the work of the six days of creation, the first day the creation of light. This was not the sun. The sun would not be created until the fourth day, but this was some supernatural solar light source. 
And then the second day, the separating of the waters. Remember that those waters that were above the firmament, and firmament means space there, from the waters below the firmament. And then the third day, the creation of plant life. Remember we said that this verse alone, in Genesis 1-9, refutes the doctrine of evolution, because evolution says that life began in the bottom of the sea, and God says it began on land, on dry ground, on the third day. And then the fourth day, the creation of the sun, moon, and stars. And the reason for that is that God was uh, create, God created the world in the first day to show its importance in the universe as opposed to the sun. Uh, various scientists and agnostics and skeptics have uh, ridiculed the size of the earth in comparison to some of the other planets and uh, heavenly bodies, and they say it is ridiculous to assume, as Christians do, that God could have could take any note whatsoever of this tiny, uh, small little speck of sand called our earth as one considers the immensity of the universe. But here you see the atheist is uh, guilty of a strange blunder. Well, what he does is this. He confuses <clears throat> size with value. And he's saying this. If something is small, it's worthless. If something is huge, it's valuable. Well, that's not always the case. I wonder uh, how many scientists who perhaps are agnostics that would take this view, uh, if they were offered a choice between a small, relatively speaking, five-carat diamond and a large five-ton pile of coal, I wonder which of the two objects they'd take. Now, obviously, they take the diamond. And so size does not always, in fact, often, does not mean that the thing is worthless. And then we saw a number of things about the first man, whose name was Adam. He was absolutely unique, a thousand times more brilliant, perhaps, than the smartest egghead today. He was uh, unique in the sense that no man ever lived before him like that. And the Cro-Magnon man, and the Neanderthal man, and the Heidelberg man, and the Piltdown man, and the Nebraska man, and all these other men were simply, are simply, in my own opinion, a basket full of moldy bones. Man, in the form of Adam, was the first human being to exist. And we said he was made in God's image. He was commanded to abstain from the tree of knowledge. And uh, he was warned that he would die twice. If he sinned, and of course Adam did sin, a class, please remember this statement. Please remember it. And I'll repeat it again. There are two deaths in the Bible, spiritual and physical death. They both mean one word can be defined by one word separation. There are two births in the Bible, physical birth and spiritual birth. And the statement is this. To be born once down here means to die twice. But to be, twi to be born twice down here means to die but once and maybe not once. Then we say that he was said that he was given a wife, and um, that he called her name Eve, and they were placed in the perfect Garden of Eden. And then in Genesis 3, the saddest chapter in all the Bible, when Adam and Eve turned their back upon a holy God, they are enticed by Satan, who takes over the body of a serpent, to sin and disobey God. And then the judgment of sin upon the man, upon the woman, upon all nature, upon the servant, and upon the devil. In this thrilling verse in Genesis 3, verse 15, the first example, the first promise of a Redeemer. And we saw much of the grace of God in the Garden of Eden. In seeking out Adam, God calls to Adam and not the other way around. When I think of this verse, and the Lord God called unto Adam, I tie that in with Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Come now, saith the Lord, let us reason together, the Bible says. Though your sins be scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. God is seen in the pages of the Bible as reasoning with men. God is saying, now, you're on your way to hell. 
you're without Christ. You're covered with sin. You're dying and your iniquities. Let's be reasonable about this. You don't want to go to hell. I don't want you to go to hell. And here we find God seeking out the man. And we find this later on in Genesis chapter 6. God determines to destroy the world, but he speaks to Noah. And we find this in Genesis 12. God speaks to Abraham. And in the last chapter of the word of God, we find God still speaking. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And that's the message. God seeking out man with this gracious invitation. And then we saw his grace in clothing them. He made coats of skin and clothed them. And this would seem to indicate that Adam indeed was a saved man. And then he shows his grace by removing Adam from the garden so that Adam would not partake of the tree of life and forever live in his sin. In chapter 4, we saw the offering of Abel and Cain. And that Cain becomes the first modernist in history inasmuch as he offers a bloodless sacrifice. And Abel then becomes the first recorded person to understand rightly that sacred statement later, without shedding of blood is no remission of sins. And then we saw the uh, murder of Abel, where that the first um, modernist now becomes the first murderer. And then the, minist the ministry of Enoch uh, from the line of Seth, and his son, whose name was Methuselah, and Methuselah literally means when he is dead it shall be sent. And that's the reason that he lived to be so long, 969 years, because God was not willing that any should perish. And we believe that when he died, then the floodwaters came upon the earth. We spent some time in Genesis chapter 6 describing the sons of God, various views to explain that, and the daughters of men. And then the flood begins in that chapter, and we see uh, God telling Noah, to build the ark 450 feet long by 75 feet wide and 70, uh, 45 feet high. And we said that this was the largest boat ever built, largest ship, rather. It's too big uh, a vessel to be called a boat. The largest ship ever built in the history of the world until 1884 when an Italian liner was built that was somewhat bigger than the ark. We ask then, attempted to answer certain questions, uh, like, uh, what is, what was the anti-Diluvian, uh, climate like? It was like a, a, sort of an opaque hothouse. What is meant by the canopy theory? And that says that life before the flood, that this world had probably hundreds of times of more water vapor in the atmosphere. And we discussed how advanced was the pre-flood civilization perhaps far more advanced than we could uh, determine today, or that we might think today. Some uh, years ago, I had the privilege of standing beside the gigantic pyramids in outside of Cairo, Egypt, and I saw these uh, pyramids, and I realized that here are millions of tons of rock, and these were hewn out of uh, quarries miles away, and uh, how in the world did they get them there and put them in the proper order that they're in? And still, after thousands of years, they think they were built perhaps as early as uh, 3000 B.C. And after 5,000 years standing, they still fit so perfectly together, these gigantic stones that you cannot take a, a card, you cannot take a sheet of paper and pass through put in between these two stones. How did they get them there? How did they transport them there? And, uh, well, we do not know, but this might be indicative, and it is possible, although we are not in the least dogmatic about this, that the pyramids may have been built during the days of Noah. But when Abraham went to Egypt in 2200 B.C., he saw the same pyramids, and perhaps told, showed Sarah these pyramids that had been there for at least 800 years at that time. And so we looked into that. 
Then we move from there on to the flood itself. We attempted to answer, uh, ask ourselves and attempted to answer certain questions then concerning when the flood began, what may have triggered the flood, how long did the flood last, was the flood worldwide, how destructive would a worldwide flood be, how big was Noah's ark, how did he gather to himself all the animals? How did he feed and keep them for a year? Were there dinosaurs on board the ark? Why do we not find animal fossils in Asia Minor? Here's a question we didn't answer, but it is in your notes, and I expect you to read it. How did the animals get from Asia Minor to their present location? Was there an ice age? Where did all the water go? Has the ark been sighted since it landed on Mount Ararat? And what was involved in Noah's prophecy concerning his three sons? And then finally, the Tower of Babel. And we said this was the first of three attempts to unify by means of a religious project the peoples of the world. The first is in Genesis 11. The second is found in the book of Daniel chapter 3 during the days of Nebuchadnezzar. And the third is yet to take place, its future, and it will take place during the middle of the tribulation in the reign of the Antichrist in the Holy of Holies in Jerusalem. God hated it then, and God hates it now. When men attempt to get together and have some type of union without unity. Well, I trust that these first 13 chapters have become a part of your thinking now. God wants you to know them. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that the things that happened to them, and these are the things that happened to Noah and to Adam and to Enoch and the rest, the scripture says are written for our ensample, for our admonition upon whom the world, the ends of the world are come. So one of the reasons that God wrote all this and recorded it for you and me and for our children is that we might profit and learn by the lessons that these men experienced. Our Father, we thank you now for these 11 chapters. and We thank you for every student that we trust has diligently read the word of God as he listened to these tapes and studied the notes. And we know that what we say and what we write as teacher and student is fallible. But what we have here is the infallible word of God, the Bible. And we pray that it will become, as we said already, a part of our heart and our brain and our life. For Jesus' sake, the living word we pray Amen.